Welcome back to my channel. I am super excited to do today's video. So today I actually got an email from YouTube that I've got a bunch of new subscribers. So welcome everybody that is new to the channel. So YouTube actually was like giving me a challenge to do some sort of an origin story. So I thought it would be fun to share with you guys kind of like where I came from, where I started with all of this and why. So I'm actually going to back up like really big time to like original crystal days which is like when I was two years old. To be perfectly honest I was actually like a really super creepy not typical kid. So about two years old is when kids start to like you know converse and like really talk and we would drive. My mom would be driving and I was just like in my car seat or whatever and anytime I would see like a body of water, whether it was like a lake or a river or like there's just a lot of random streams like in Colorado where I grew up, I would express to my mom like how afraid I was. Now take in mind, I'm this like two year old kid, so why is there a two year old kid that's expressing fear of water when I had never even had swim lessons at that point? So after I had been like expressing this fear for a while, finally my mom was like, what's the fear, you know, why are you afraid? And at two, I started telling her that um, in my last life that I had died and I had kids and a husband that I left behind and that I was really upset and that I did not, um, I didn't want to go, I wasn't ready to go. And that because, because of that, I was afraid of water. So you can imagine my mom with her two-year-old only child is like, something's something's off with my kid. And like luckily my mom's really cool, like my family is very spiritual, I'm actually Native American, I'm Cherokee, I'm actually registered with the tribe which is really cool. My mom did not understand where I was getting this from, I was too little to be making up such a, like an exaggerated, you know, story and I wasn't the kind of kid that really watched a lot of television at that age. Um, so my mom was always like, I don't really know where you got that from. And the fact that I kept bringing it up consistently. So the fear of water really carried on like to my adult life, honestly. Um, but let's go to like when I was about three. So my aunt didn't live far. She lived probably like five to ten minutes away from us. That's my mom's sister. And we would go hang out at my aunt's house. And on the weekends, if all of my family was in town visiting, we would crash at my aunt's house because she had a pretty decent sized house. So she, my aunt had like a full finished basement, um, basically apartment. There was even like a kitchenette down there. So my mom and I would stay down there um, if we were there on the weekends. And soon, like after, this was when I was about three, I started sneaking upstairs because my aunt was this like super, super night owl. So this was like new and exciting to me at three because I, you know, my mom was like very structured, like she, she, you know, raised me to be very structured. And I couldn't figure out why my aunt didn't run her household the same. So my aunt was up super, super late and I would go upstairs and my aunt loved me and so my aunt would just let me stay up with her for part of the night or all the night. <clears throat> so this is kind of the point where I started realizing that I was super interested in the supernatural and creepy stuff. I was literally three years old. So my aunt has always liked scary stuff. She actually um, had a lot of witchy stuff around her house year round. Um, she wasn't Wiccan or, or pagan or anything like that. She just really liked witches. She collected witches stuff. So um, I think that was one of the reasons why she liked kind of the dark side or whatever. So there were a couple of shows that she introduced to me as a kid. One was Tales from the Crypt. 
The second was Elvira, which probably wasn't the most appropriate for a three-year-old, but you know. And then the last one was Tales from the Dark Side. Now, I know what you might be thinking at home if you have a three-year-old and you're like, I would never let my kid watch any of that stuff. And trust me, my aunt and my mom tried to, you know, force me not to watch that stuff, but I was like infatuated with the supernatural. I remember there was a point a couple of times where my aunt and mom tried to take me away from, particularly Tales from the Dark Side. If you haven't seen it, it's like an 80s, um, you know, television series and it was creepy for the 80s for sure. And it has this huge intro of like, these are the tales from the dark side. If I can find the link to the intro, I'll link it below. But what my, my mom and my aunt would try to do is they would try to remove me from, you know, the shows of the supernatural and I would just bawl. I would cry my eyes out. It was like, I lived for that stuff. So that kind of carried on, you know, as I got older, I still loved scary stuff. None of that stuff ever scared me. I wasn't really freaked out by the thought of ghosts or the thought of, um, you know, I mean, aliens do kind of scare me, being honest, but like, I just kind of accepted it as part of our world. So as I got older, um, I started learning the history of my aunt's house. So my aunt lived in a house, she owned a home that had actually been in my generation or in my family for many generations. Like I want to say three or four generations. It was originally built by like, I think it was my great grandfather or something like that. Originally in this part of Denver, it was the actual first house of the neighborhood. So I started getting older and I would hang out at my aunt's house and she had like this really giant living room. Um, you know, like I said, she had like a full finished apartment in the basement but she kind of converted the living room into kind of a playroom too. It had like a big screen TV and anytime me or you know other nieces and nephews or grandkids would come over, that was kind of like our playroom and we could watch TV or do whatever we wanted. So oftentimes there would be, you know, I'd be down there by myself and you would hear knocking on the doors, you would hear um, doors opening and closing in the basement. Now take in mind, this wasn't really like a scary basement. It was pretty much like an apartment. So it wasn't really what you would think of as a basement. There's stuff in here. And I never really mentioned it to any of my family until I got older. Once my cousins started to experience stuff, then I think that we realized that, yeah, this is something that's going on to all of us. It's not just like me in particular. So I do remember one night, I want to say I was like, I think I was like 10 or 11 or something. And my cousins and I had been playing hide and seek and we found this, um, closet that we didn't even really knew existed in the basement and when we opened the closet we realized there had been generations of our you know grandparents slash aunts or whatever um, and all of their wedding dresses were in this closet and it was really eerie it was just kind of like out of a scary movie um, some of them were so old they were like yellow and you know lace and they had you know kept in bad condition they'd just gotten really old and, and rotted just from sitting in this closet and I remember my cousins and I were like, this is so creepy. And I remember we would never go in that closet. Later, we did figure out that that was the door that we would hear open and close all the time when we were downstairs by ourselves. As we got older and got braver, we decided to kind of actually play games with the entities or whatever was down there. Honestly, I'm assuming it was family um, from past generations. We never felt threatened. None of us got hurt. And... Like I said, we would kind of play ghostly games. There were a lot of times that we would, um, and I'm talking like we're kids, like 10 to 13, somewhere in there. Um, we would do the, the game of, and then you would hear it knock back. It would be like, I mean, it happened all the time. And I guess it just kind of became accepting of our family that that house was haunted and we all knew it was there. I did ask my aunt and my mom about it, and um, my mom didn't talk about it too much, but my aunt was like, oh yeah, we, we think that, um, you know, the grandparents are here and all this stuff, and, you know, it's been, this house has been in the family for generations, we don't think that they're stuck here, we just think that they come to visit. So when I was 13 years old, of course my, you know, interest in the supernatural kept growing, and uh, my grandmother had approached me, and this is when I figured out my heritage was Native American. I know that most of you are watching me right now, and you're like, you don't look Native American at all. It's not necessarily about looks. 
You guys also have to understand that I bleach my hair and I have bleached my hair since I was like in middle school. Um, and if I were to let like my natural hair grow out, it would be jet black. So my grandmother wanted to kind of educate me on the Native American heritage and um, she ended up giving me all of the heirlooms that were passed down from many generations of my family being Cherokee. So at 13 years old, actually other stuff started kind of um, happening to me too. I can't really say um, if I was an empath, you know, at that age per se. I think in high school my empathy really started to kick in, but um, I do remember at 13 that magic number for some reason. Um, I remember having like predictions, like random predictions, like little ones, nothing big. Like I would think about a distant aunt or a cousin and they would call or, you know, something would happen. and. Uh, so at 14, I feel like my empathy really kicked into overdrive. I didn't really fit in anywhere. It kind of sucked. I was in ninth grade and, uh, you know, I was like, um, I guess a skater chick. I was really into like Blink-182 and Gwen Stefani and No Doubt. And, um, you know, it was like my ultimate goal was to be Gwen Stefani when I grew up. I had also done gymnastics and dance my whole life. And so I got into cheerleading. I actually got accepted onto the team. And I became bullied really, really badly, um, not by everyone, but by a couple of girls in particular. And I remember, you know, there were some points that I was pretty suicidal as a kid, and it was because I was just getting bullied so badly. And my, I would come home and my family would be like, you know, if, if she treats you bad, treat her bad back. And I just remember telling myself, like, I couldn't do that. I remember thinking to myself, I... I feel so terrible when people treat me that way. I would never treat someone that way because I don't want them to feel the way that I felt. And I didn't realize at that point that I was really starting to get my empathy like gift as a human being. My grandmother, I was really, really close to my grandmother um, growing up. Like she was my salvation. She, my mother was a single parent. She, she rocked it. She did an awesome job, but there was something about my grandmother that I just really, really idolized and like really just wanted to be her. She went to Chicago from Oklahoma and uh, went into fashion school. So I really thank her and um, I feel like I follow in her footsteps for the love of beauty and the love of fashion and like all things girly and uh, I was kind of a punky chick like I had pink hair at one point and I was a cheerleader and my coach didn't like that so I actually ended up getting benched for um, you know coloring my hair pink and it wasn't even a bright pink it was like a cotton candy pink and um, so that made me feel really like withdrawn I also was a skateboarder I grew up in Colorado so I was really into snowboarding with my friends and family and um, that w it was like the two like crossing cheerleading it was like you had this group of girls most of them had grown up together um, gone to dance school together cheer camp and dance together gymnastics and then I hadn't I kind of had broke off from my elementary school middle school friends and you know was this new girl in this group of people and yeah I could dance and I could cheer and I could do tumbles but why was I wanting to have pink hair and why why is she a skateboarder? And like, it, so I was really in this like tug of war of like, it was so cliche and such like a high school clique of everyone wanted me to either like, I couldn't be friends with the skater crowd because I was a cheerleader and then I couldn't be in the cheerleading crowd because I was a skater. And so it was this really like awkward cross and um, finally I did find some friends that were, you know, accepting of both sides. But my grandmother was still like my salvation behind trying to survive high school. To be honest, my high school was the typical 90s, you know, ridiculous hit drama of like, I don't know, pick one, 10 things I hate about you, can't hardly wait, like, you know, all mean girls, like whatever, like that was so, my high school had a little bit of every single one of those films. My grandmother died suddenly. Uh, it was really hard. It's still, it's even hard to talk about it. And like, you'd think this many years have passed that I'd be okay, but I guess loss is never something that's easy. My grandmother had been a smoker for most of her life and it ended up causing something called hardening of the arteries. So you have the two main arteries that run down each side of your body and basically plaque builds up in your arteries. 
one side we had the surgery done and it went great and the other side happened and it didn't go so great. I remember the day like it was yesterday, we left our house because at that point she had been, she moved in with my mom and I because of her health. I remember she, we were in the car and she looked back at me and she goes, wouldn't it be strange? And I said, what? And she was like, wouldn't it be strange if this was the last time I was at our house? And I just, I, I know I looked at her and I was like, Grandma, don't say that, you know, like, don't say something like that. And she's like, well, it's true. Well, it's true. And um, it was just strange. It was really strange. So she had the surgery. Uh, there was some sort of weird emergency at the last minute. Her surgeon actually was, but long story short was that they um, they did the surgery. The first few days she looked great, and then all of a sudden one night we got a phone call that she'd gotten blood clots in her legs, and um, the emergency doctor said that the only way she was going to survive was if if they amputated. My grandma had been a dancer for most of her life. She. Um, you, you know, she was like 72 when she died, and uh, she still went out every single Saturday. She had a boyfriend because her husband had passed away um, before I was even born, my grandfather. And she had a boyfriend, and they went out every single Saturday to dance. And so um, when they told us they were going to have to to remove her leg, my mom and I were pretty devastated because... To be bluntly honest, my grandmother was very vain because she was into fashion. And second, you know, dancing was her life and we weren't sure what was gonna happen. Hours had gone by and um, the doctors came into the waiting room and told my mom and I that she was basically brain dead. Um, you know, we they had put her on life support. They did go ahead and amputate her leg. She was not responsive. Uh, my whole family had gathered at the hospital and that night previously when she did have like the heart attack and the stroke, she kind of had everything in one night just kind of give out. My mom and I had sat down, um, my grandmother willed everything she had to my mom and I and in her will she also asked that my mother and I make her final decisions. My grandfather had died when my mother was 13 which is um, my aunt and my mom and my uncle's father, he died uh, of brain cancer when they were little, little kids. And so it, gave, it made my grandmother a widow for uh, many years. The problem was is when my grandfather had died, um, I believe it was like in the 60s, and at that point, you know, brain cancer wasn't very treatable. You know, people just, it was, science wasn't as advanced as it is now. Um, kind of just laid there as a vegetable. He never woke up and finally six months later he died. And the biggest thing my grandmother had told us was never ever let me lay there like a vegetable. I don't ever want to be like your father or your grandfather. So, um, and so that day after the family gathered at the hospital and, and everybody said their goodbyes, uh, we did decide to take her off of life support. We had a talk with grandma in the room before it happened. And obviously there wasn't a ton of fancy, um, you know, paranormal shows out there to educate you in, on anything, you know. And so I remember my mother and I went into the room with my grandmother and we sat there and talked to her because they said that she still had slight brain activity, but she, they said she'd never recover from it because she just, it was so, it was a really bad stroke and a heart attack. And so my mother and I sat there and we each held one of my grandmother's hands and we said, <clears throat> we said, grandma, there's, there's been some stuff happen. We think you know what's going on. And uh, we said, we talked to the doctors and we, we want to respect your wishes and, and we think that it's time for you to go. You know, my mom said, it's time for you to go with dad. You can't stay here any longer. The biggest fear my mom and I had was the doctors told us that when you take someone off life support, sometimes they can last weeks. Sometimes they can even last months. And, uh, you know, they can suffer, they can't suffer, whatever. It just depends on the person. And so my mom and I were, we were terrified. My mom and I were just terrified. We didn't want her to, uh, to hang on. We didn't want her to suffer. We didn't want her to, to feel pain. 
And so when we went in the room, we asked her to please go quickly. We said, it's gonna be okay. And we said, you've gotta go. You don't need to stay anymore. And uh, you've gotta go for us. You gotta, you can't stay here. It's time for you to move on. And it was horribly sad, um, but relieving at the same time because for over 24 hours, maybe even 48 hours at that point, she hadn't had any brain activity and all of a sudden she started crying. And it wasn't, you know, I mean, she obviously wasn't sitting up crying like a normal person would, but tears started to run down her face. And it was almost like she was acknowledging what we just said. And <clears throat> thank God she went within about two minutes after we removed her from life support. I was pretty distraught. I was a hot mess. My whole family was a hot mess. Um, everyone in my family isn't the type that wants to have this giant dramatic uh, funeral. We've all been raised to, you know, instead of having a funeral and mourning my death, go out and celebrate. Continue to live your life. Um, don't stop, you know, like. And so we did, we had this like life celebration for my grandmother after she, after she crossed over. And I remember going home that night, like I said, she lived with us and I was in bed. I, I had the basement, um, in Colorado there's just a lot of basements. It was a full finished basement and um, it was like my own apartment. I had a bathroom, two bedrooms, and a living room for like a kid. It was really a great deal. I was in my room and I had all the lights out. I was really upset. I was in that phase where you're like basically asleep but kind of awake, like where you can still hear your surroundings but you're asleep, if that makes sense. So I remember I was asleep and I've been upset. I've been crying all day. I'm just devastated. And all of a sudden, I hear the door open to my room. <clears throat> it didn't wake me up. I just, I can hear what's going on. The door opens to my room. The lights are like going on in my room. The closet door opens and it sounds like someone's looking for something in my room. Why I didn't wake up, I think I was just so exhausted. And so I'm laying there asleep and all of a sudden I hear someone say, Crystal. And I said, yeah. And I'm, I'm asleep, basically, you know, I'm still in that in and out phase, you know, where you're like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, what, who, you know. And all of a sudden, I hear my grandmother, and, and even the person that said Crystal was my grandmother, I hear her say, I love you, I just want you to know that I love you. And I freaking sat, I, well, first I said, I love you too, Grandma. Well, when the word Grandma came out of my mouth, I had, it was like, that was when the light bulb went off. I sat up in bed so quickly. I looked around. The closet door to my bedroom is open. The door to my room is open. The lights are on. I don't go to sleep like that. I realize I have just encountered my grandmother. My very first full-fledged, 100% hands-down paranormal experience is my grandma. So on one side, I'm scared shitless. And then on the other side, I'm excited. And I don't really know how to react because... Part of me is mourning over her death, and part of me is like, did she really go? I, I mean, I wasn't concerned that she hadn't crossed over. It was just kind of this, like, aha moment that just because someone's gone and, like, passed away on this side doesn't mean that they're gone forever. And it was, like, all of these possibilities, like, and thoughts and, like, processes started opening up in my head. I knew what I had experienced, and I, so I ran upstairs to go tell my aunt and my mom. My aunt... And my mom are awake. And I'm like, what the heck's going on? Like, it's 3 in the morning. Why is everybody awake? My aunt was sleeping in my grandmother's room that night because that was where my grandmother stayed. They had just started clearing out her closet. And that was just because my mom was so heartbroken that she was gone. And my aunt was in her room. And my aunt said she came in the room and started asking where her clothes were. And she was mad and like pissed her clothes were gone. And I guess my aunt started talking to her like half awake, half asleep also saying, it's gonna be okay, everything's fine. You don't need anything here anymore. You can go, you can go on. And then that was it. So everyone in the house had had that experience that night and no one slept that night. This like sprung this huge obsession with the paranormal for me. This is right where it started, right where it started. So at 16, I did the typical bullshit of a high school kid. I was going into graveyards overnight where I shouldn't be. There was a couple asylums that had been shut down from the 50s and 60s in downtown Denver, which are no longer there. 
Um, even there was one in Wheat Ridge that was really haunted and me and my high school boyfriend and all of my friends would go break into these places that we shouldn't have broken into and um, we didn't have any equipment. We would just do crazy stuff at night and we had some crazy awesome experiences and um, that's really where it started. It's where I also feel like I started like developing my belief system as far as, you know, just because we're gone here doesn't mean that it's over. It doesn't mean that you can't continue things. It doesn't mean this is the final chapter. Um, I just really started to realize that there's so much more than what people realize is, is right here in front of us. So Aaron from Paranormal Challenge, I had known him for years. Um, he was one of those people that I would go investigate with many, many times. I started realizing what skeptics are and, you know, I'm not here to ever push my beliefs onto somebody else. I really feel like the paranormal is something that until you experience it like firsthand, you're not going to believe it and that's okay. I'm never going to be that person that argues with somebody that's like, you have to believe it because of A, B, C, D, and E, F, G. No, not necessarily. You need to experience it. and. I am a true believer that either if you don't experience anything, there's two reasons for it. Either you're completely shut down to it because you're afraid of it, or you're completely shut off to it because you don't know what the unknown is and you're not willing to really be open-minded about learning. I didn't really start doing like technologically based ghost hunting till I was like 18 or 19. 2010, I applied to Paranormal Challenge twice. The first time we got turned down and the second time Dave Schrader wrote me back and he was like, I think you're a really cool chick. Um, Dave Schrader is from Darkness Radio and Dave Schrader got me in with the casting producer who then forwarded my information to Zach Biggins who also approved our team for Paranormal Challenge. We got to go to Jerome. We won the season finale episode and the last cool part of that was it opened up so much networking for me and it was really, really awesome. I got to meet other producers, I got to work on set at other productions, I got to learn the difference between someone trying to do a Hollywood production versus my kind, which is Authentic Paranormal Investigations, and that's why I'm here for you guys, to teach you the real and the not real of paranormal production. So hopefully you guys liked my origin story. If you have time, please go watch an episode of Tales from the Dark Side, just because it is super 80s, super ridiculous, and hey, maybe you'll learn something from that show too, who knows? In the meantime, please give my video a thumbs up. Please subscribe to my channel if you're not already. Make sure you're following me on social media because I'm always there and share some of your stories with me. What was your first paranormal experience? Tell me about it, guys. And I will catch you next time.